Hello and welcome back everybody to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and this is episode 236. Each and every week I sit down here at my office desk and in my beautiful surroundings and I answer your questions. If you have questions, send them to the podcast and the address is podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, this week we've got actually a nice mix of questions. Um... Uh, a real nice mix and uh, the last few months I've noticed the questions are a lot a lot cleaner a lot more specific a lot more information and anything you can provide me helps me answer your particular questions so let's get started with a question from Neil and Neil says something funny in the beginning he goes I know how much you love answering questions about other people's programs but hear me out because I think this counts as a Dan specific question um one of the issues I have with talking about other people's programs is that sometimes, uh, like there's a, there's a program a lot of people uh, comment on, yet the person who invented the program was real clear about the necessi necessity of uh, extra supplements that are illegal in the United States. Uh, it, was, it was real clear about it. And uh, so to do the program and keep improving, you know, you might need some extra juice, so to speak. Uh, sometimes other programs, I I just don't understand the program at all. And so commenting on it would mostly be, you know, I don't understand the program. But this question from Neil is quite good. You have spoken about 531 before. That's Jim Wendler's really excellent training program. Uh, I've, I've admired Jim's work for a long time. I mean, I, it's got to be two decades at least now, maybe three. And I think his 531 program is outstanding. My brother Gary did it for seven years, which is a long time for any program to work. As I often joke, my brother Gary is smart enough not to listen to me. So there you go. And how you have used it successfully with your high school athletes. Uh, true, we, we used uh, 531 uh, quite a bit uh, certain times of the year. The 531 period works really well in season in the situation we were in. Uh, it just worked well um, because you can get a good workout in. We had some concepts like the warm-up is the workout, which was a, a fairly long kettlebell warm-up. We did mobility, flexibility, push-ups, goblet squats, uh, various parts of the Turkish get-up. It was a learning period with a lot of work. Then after that, we would do 5-3-1, and then very often after that, you know, we would do two lifts each workout. And then after that, very often with the high school athlete, getting that deload week to work is hard because most of the boys, a lot of the boys didn't take a deload week seriously. And a, a lot of, so they would fool around with the weights. And some of the other boys uh, thought that deload and light meant to go heavy again, which kind of defeats the whole program. That was the hardest part. But the question you ask is good. My question is this, Jim Wendler writes, the accessories don't matter. So auxiliary accessory exercises, but he does have a whole list of them in his books, at least the ones I have. What accessories do you personally favor for 531 for yourself and for your athletes? And so so I, think, I think Jim allows for it, and I don't know if he uh, don't matter on that, but let me say this. There's, there's a few points I need to make first off. Uh, when you train, and you, since you specifically asked about the high school athletes, it's important. No matter how hard the prog program was, including mass made simple, uh, all those complexes and all those high rep squats, the teenage boy will <laughs> vomit in a bucket. You know, once they stop turning, you know, absolutely pale, will walk over and start doing curls and uh, tricep exercises. Um, I, I worked with a team one time. I couldn't. I don't think the boy. There was a boy who benched two hundred. They weren't very good, and. But I would turn my back and they would all be doing bench dips, those where you put your feet up on one bench and you have your just your hands and another one, like reverse push-ups where you go like this. And these guys did every variation of curl I've ever seen in my life, and they're all sort of very weak. So that's kind of the bigger issue there. Number two, I think the uh, adolescent I, uh, athlete, the high school, the adolescent high school athlete needs some extra work. Uh, and there's some good reasons for it. First, I mean, I, I, I'm certainly no expert in, you know, the challenges of, 
you know, the body moving through puberty. But what I know is that not long, my athletes are going to be adults. And so I always thought it was important for them to learn all the traditional gym exercises. Uh, my athletes would always know how to snatch, clean and jerk, clean and press, uh, bench, squat, deadlift, all the kettlebell movements. I mean, all of them. Uh, they knew how to tumble. We did sprint training. Uh, we did the standard barbell lifts. We did hurdle walkovers, hurdle hops, uh, sled pulls, farmer walks, this whole thing. But I also knew long term, there'd be other exercises that would keep them uh, fit and healthy uh, for a long time, which I think really is part of my job too. I, I would, it would bother me if I had lost an athlete to an injury that they would never get better than. That always, that would, I don't think it ever happened, but it would always worry me. Um, so assistant exercises should be done then for a couple reasons. Uh, the first reason they're going to do them anyway. They're going to sneak in the gym and do the extra stuff anyway. Number two, I think you're setting them up for a, a lifelong training program. Now with my brother Gary's experience, you could argue that 531 is a lifetime, uh, program. And I, and I appreciate that. And I think it's true. Um, but then the third reason is, as great as those four basic exercises are, and that would be the military press, the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift, I still think uh, that there's there's need for more. I, I think the Olympic lift, the quick lifts need to be there. I think the kettlebell lifts need to be there. And so I don't think uh, Jim and I disagree at all on this, but just remember, we're, I'm trying to expand the athlete. Uh, if I had a team that every single athlete, you know, bench 300, you know, squatted 400 and deadlifted 500 in, in a high school. I know we would be very strong, but the athletic side of the modern American football game, the athletic side of a lot of the sports I teach might not be uh, there. Um, well, they'd be strong, but I worry about all those other qualities necessary to play certain sports. Um, the, the nice thing about following Jim is Jim, uh, was a Division One athlete. I think he played football for University of Arizona. Um, I was a Division One athlete. Uh, I was the track MVP up at Utah State University. And the reason I bring those two points, besides the fact I love, you know, saying how wonderful I am, but the idea is this. Sometimes it's nice to get information from somebody who has kind of been there, competed in the, in, in the public eye, had the stresses and strains of elite performance, and then kind of gives back, which is why uh, anytime someone says they're going to slide over to a Jim Wendler program, I always applaud wildly because I think of all the powerlifting programs I've seen, it's the most reasonable, doable, repeatable. Um, what are the best uh, accessory lifts? Well, now that's a billion dollar question. Uh, Obviously, I like the gymnastics family first. Uh, that would be the dip, the chin up, uh, any of those variations. Anything that looks like a gymnastics move. I mean, from, uh, I, I can't, I've never been able to do one, but, uh, you know, when I see certain wrestlers doing kip ups, that's always pretty impressive to me. Uh, I would throw the tumbling in there. Uh, the nice thing about tumbling is it also gives you some, uh, fall prevention skills that'll be very valuable much later in your life and just uh, to prevent shoulder injuries and, and kind of silly finger and wrist injuries from trying to stab the ground when you fall uh, as an athlete. From there, uh, I would say, so I would say the gymnastics world, uh, monkey bars, uh, rope climbing, all that. And rope climbing has a great value if you ever got to save your life. Uh, um, certainly climbing a wall would be the same. Being able to crawl is another one. Um, if you Obviously, the track and field world of sprinting, running, all that should be in there too. The next would be the, the, the general bodybuilding movements. Um, it could be as, it, it could be machines like the lat pull, the leg curl, the leg extension. I, I, I understand each one of those has issues, but I think there's real good value, um, just to kind of give the joints a different, uh, different range of work. Um, from there, your mileage may vary, but, uh, once you move into things like the, uh, the hyperextension, the reverse hyper, the glute ham raise. Uh, there's going to be a little bit more teaching and training that goes into those. Um, and of course, you know, I was going to buy reverse hypers one year 
And the, I just got to tell you from the heart, the price was just uh, uh, too hard for us. So think of it that way. Think of the gymnastics supplements uh, to make the athlete uh, safer, uh, survival techniques, the bodybuilding world to give some, you know, what Vince Garana called roundness, I think it was, uh, of a muscle. And then the, the third, the third of those more, more complex and more nuanced exercises, uh, the remaining deadlift and things like that, you know, where you do have to have a, the glute ham raise, I think has to be done correctly. Uh, and some, and these all come with extra equipment. So, you know, it, it all depends in this case now on your budget and the time you have to teach all that extra. Neil, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And thank you for asking that. That was very good. So this next question comes from Scott. It's a little different and I'll do my best to answer it. I was wondering about your thoughts on the philosophy of stoicism. I've been reading a book, Never Let Go, by some fellow named Dan John. That's a, um, a very, that's very funny. And uh, yeah, that's my book. Yeah. Chapter two, the rule of five uh, came over to me as very stoic. I and mean, that's interesting. Answer this how you want to. Waits as a uh, meditation, cathartic or eureka moment, like the goblet squat. I always appreciate your wisdom on these topics. Um, I, I have to tell you something. It, it, this, he's no longer with us, but John Powell and I had this con conversation. Well, it was, it was in the early nineties, 1990s. And, uh, he was asking about me about something I did with my throwers. Now, when the world record holder in the discus is asking you a question about how you coach throwers, you, you got to stop and make sure you have a good answer. Okay. And one of the things I had in my, uh, in my uh, worksheets, uh, I like I always liked having um, lots of pieces of paper, and my favorite one was the one filled with every drill we did, or or could do in a year. Uh, you know, if you're a an American football coach, there's a lot of situations, so it's nice to have like a card file or an index of special plays to practice. Well, as a throws coach, I have lots and lots of drills. And I would go through and just make sure we kind of covered each one every year and then sometimes every month. So one of them was called Tai Chi. And he goes, what does Tai Chi mean? I go, oh no, it's, it's, a, uh, it's when we do our track practice. It's when we do our movement, uh, in a met very meditative form. And I got to tell you, uh, John was a, could be a gruff guy, but it's one of the few times that he kind of just stopped, dropped, everything and focused on what I was saying. He goes, can you, can you tell me what that means? I say, well, we, we, we find a place where it's quiet and what I ask my throwers to do in a very small st space, cause I wanted small steps is, and even with your eyes closed and we would have meditative music. Uh, at the time I had to use uh, long play, you know, LPs, you know, stereos with the record, a meditation record with, that music you hear when you get, you know, your massage, you know, now I would probably just plug in brain FM on the stereo and the Bluetooth, you know, start pushing buttons. And I would ask the athletes, okay, what we're going to do is I just want you to, you know, practice your turn in a dark room with meditative music on for 15 minutes. And what's interesting is that the good ones uh, would always get some nuanced idea, some, some, some simple thing that there's a, there's an important phrase in coaching. I might've said this 30,000 times, but I might not have ever said it to you. So sometimes you think as a coach, you said what the athlete is about to say, and maybe you did say that, but they didn't hear what you were saying. So I would, uh, at the end, you know, after this, some, uh, 15 would be an exaggeration. Let's say 10. That would be more likely. Yeah. And we would do the 10 minutes of just practicing the turn, quiet head, quiet eyes, just let the movement happen is, you know, an athlete might pick up. The weird thing is, is my orbit is so natural when I just go through smoothly. And of course, that's the key is when they realize that smooth goes far. There's two phrases we always use at discus camp. Smooth goes far and fit goes far. Um, if you're carrying around 90 pounds of excess body fat, you're probably not going to throw as far as you would if you cut, you know, 75 of those pounds off. 
fit. I mean, if you have all your joints are healthy, you tend to throw farther. If your, you know, if your life is balanced, if things are balanced. So Scott, it's been a, it's been a part of my life, my whole career. Now, of course, you know, uh, you know, I was a, I took a lot of philosophy classes in college and I'm much more of a Wittgensteinian than a Stoic. Don't any of you worry about that distinction, but I certainly understand uh, a lot about, you know, being a Stoic. Uh, when I was young, everybody I knew was because that's the way I, people like my parents, you know, depression era, you know, I'm, I'm, I was stunned to discover how many siblings that my father had lost in, uh, in his youth, you know, I think four survived, but I think three died. And then my mom, she lost, I think she lost a couple of brothers, maybe three brothers in the Spanish influenza of 1918. <laughs> it was terrible. It was so bad. And then, uh, with these other issues through the years, uh, it wasn't uncommon for families to lose, you know, multiple siblings. And uh, so growing up with parents who had survived that, the Depression, my father, of course, uh, World War II, and then he sent his sons off to uh, Vietnam and Korea. And, you know, uh, the way they dealt with things always, you know, um, was with the uh, you know, this is what's happened. You know, I still got to go to work in the morning. I still got to make breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I got to make my bed. So for me, when I read Marcus Aurelius and the others in college, um, I didn't have that uh, conversion experience that a lot of people in the last decade have had. Because I, I mean, you know, when you're, you're around people who, you know, who've seen the death of their brothers, sisters, and children, uh, my neighborhood. Um, I, I lost a lot of friends in my youth to auto accidents, uh, a drowning, uh, all kinds of other things, you know, and my friends who would have been in those situations, you just, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you go to school and you study math. That's, that's how you get through the day. So thank you. Yes, I do use this. Uh, I also like the word you use cathartic. There are times where I, and I've used this in many of my Teen Nation articles where I don't, I don't train. Uh, and I'm just, I am out there to work out my stress, work out my anger. Um, you know, I know I've mentioned this before, Scott, on the, on the podcast, I've had some tough issues in, in the last p past five years, uh, tough for me to overcome, uh, tough for me to deal with. Very often my workout was simply, uh, a workout. I got to work these things out of myself. Um, there's something magical about the deadlift. There's something magical about the clean and jerk in my life. Uh, you know, dro dropping a heavy clean and jerk and dropping a heavy deadlift seems to uh, <laughs> be the poor man's therapist. Uh, thank you, Scott. Fun question, a little different, but I, I always like those questions that make me think and expand a little bit. So much appreciated. I've got a question from Bob. My question are about standards. Do you have standards for a 65 year old male? Are they standard standards that are written down somewhere? What level of fitness do you associate with the standard 80th percentile? I'm a big fan of the 80 20 rule. So if I can be as strong as 80% of the 60 year old, 65 year old male population, I'd be happy. Well, listen, uh, Bob, you know, we got people in the inner circle who are in our, in our age cohort. I'm in your age cohort. And uh, if you're as strong as me, I can almost guarantee you're in that 20% of the population. Um, I teach, you know, I help, I teach and help out at the senior center. And the biggest pushback I get from when I'm helping people is, and I've said this on the podcast before, the 55 year olds, they, everything I do is too hard. And it's funny because I'm, I'm 67 and I'm older than they are. And yet uh, they, they haven't, they haven't done a lot in 30, 40 years and these workouts, as easy as I think they are, sort of roast them. You know, I don't have standards for 65 year old males, but if you go to the uh, uh, Russian kettlebell certification, the RKC, they've got some good numbers there. Um, and I don't have the numbers available to me right now. I have them on some forms, but I went through all of them and, and I put them down as masters. But uh, I think uh, at your age, I think you're supposed to be able to snatch uh, the 20 kilo bell 50 times in three minutes. Now I can still 
passed the, the open test. That's the 24 K five minutes, a hundred reps. And well, cause I kind of have to, cause when I go into the TC certs, I got to be able to do almost everything. But, uh, so go to Dragon Door and look up their, uh, the, the numbers they have to, to, you know, to qualify, uh, as an RKC, you know, top of my head, I think that if you're in your sixties as a typical 65 year old male, being able to single hand press a 20, which is 45 pounds, the weight of a barbell would be a, would be a good standard, uh, to be able to, you know, goblet squat a 20 kilo bell with some respectable technique and maybe, a, you know, five to 10 reps. Um, if you type, if you Google my name, you know what, these are all available at danjohnuniversity.com. But if you Google my name, I think it's called sleep, Dan John Sleepus in Seattle. Cause I couldn't, um, I, I don't know why I, 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 I took Paul Lysingo's numbers. I took my numbers. I took some others in the new book that is going to be out shortly. I also have a whole, the same set of numbers. And then I also have, um, uh, Harry Pascal's numbers, which I was just looking at today. And he considers, uh, uh, a moderate or st strong man to be able to clean and press 165, uh, snatch 165, uh, 75 uh, kilos for my uh, friends and neighbors uh, all across the world outside of America. Uh, I think the deadlift is 350, which is what, 155 kilos. And um, the the other numbers are all pretty reasonable too. It's like a the, the squat number is quite low. But what I like about people like Harry Pascal, who wrote this in the, in the early 1950s, um, is the numbers are reasonable. And I, and I always like that. So at your age, Bob, I would say if you can do the 50 snatches in three minutes with the 20, you can press the 20 with both hands, you can gobble squat the 20 kilo bell. I, I'm going to tell you, you're doing okay. Uh, AARP magazine had a recent uh, edition of um, Laird Hamilton is on the cover and his wife, her, oh, Gabriella Reese. I was going to say, I was going to say Reese, uh, but Gabriella Reese are on the cover and they do have some numbers there, uh, a flexibility numbers, a stand on one foot number. And I think those are all just fine. Generally, I use the, the numbers from the Nordic company, uh, countries when they report this kind of thing. Um, I have the books are upstairs in my, uh, in my my big living room, uh, but uh, that's something I've really really enjoyed. Uh, one of the big numbers I want you to think about, Bob, is your waistline. Uh, I would really like it if your waistline was under 37 inches. That's some of the new research that's coming up. Uh, is that um, I've always used the half your height number, and now insert joke. Uh, my problem is I need to be taller, but I've used half your height number my whole career. But now some of the research from the, the Scandinavian Nordic countries is that, yeah, get yourself under 37 inches. So 36, no matter what your height is, 36, 35, and, and the, the, you know, the risks of issues is, is much, much lower. Um, so I gave you a couple numbers, waistline, some lifting numbers. Um, honestly, I'm going to tell you now the answer. And I tell my inner circle this, okay? So Earl Nightingale always talks about, you know, to lead the field, you got to get in the top 5% of anything you do. And I always tell people that is so easy to do. I think I'm in the top 5% of everything I've ever tried. Only because, well, for one thing, I try to find the number. For books, if you sell 10,000 copies of a book, you're in the top 5% of authors of all time. 10,000. Um, Never Let Go, was, which was mentioned above, uh, I sold 17,000 in one weekend. So yeah, that's pretty good. Um, as a discus thrower, I don't think there's any question. I'm in the top 5% of all time lifting. I think I'm in the top 5% of all time. Um, so, so many little things. I, 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 but here's the one I want you to listen to. Um, Tom Plummer tells us at his workshops that only 14% of Americans have gym equipment or uh, belong to a gym. When you talk to the people at the gyms, they'll tell you that very, very few people come in. So to be in the top 5% in exercise, one out of 20 people get to that level. 
one out of 20 people exercise regularly in America. One out of 20. I would say exercise at all uh, be one out of 20. So, Bob, you're in the, you're in the, you're a, you're a five percenter just by exercising. Okay. So good, good for you. Now let's see if you can get those other standards and then maybe down the line, you and me can come up with some more. Okay. Thanks. We got a question from uh, Farron. Farron says, I have a decent home gym set up with rack, rack, played, dumbbells, etc. However, I want to take a break from that and go out on a cut for about 10 months at a 50, 500, pardon me, 500 calorie deficit and just maintain the mass I have and lose fat. I have kettlebells, the duffel style, handbags, push-up stands, stuff like that. Any recommendation of a routine I could do three to four times a week utilizing that stuff? Well, 500 calorie deficit. The first thing I would do, uh, Farron, if I'm you, uh, I would take a week aside and get that minus 500 in every seven days in a row. If it's six days in a row, don't start until you get seven. If it's five days in a row, don't start until you get seven. If it's less than five days, you're not serious, so why are we wasting our time? And uh, the best thing you can do for this uh, 10 months um, is it, maintaining that caloric deficit is, I mean, by itself is a great base to start this program. Um, where the 500 calories will come from, now that's the next step up. So, gentle listener, let's follow what he said. He's going to drop out 500 calories. All right, that's a good plan for anybody. But I'm arguing this. Until he can do it for a week or two, worrying about exactly what macronutrients and all that stuff is a waste of his time. So, one week, ex two weeks, experiment with that minus 500 deficit. Um, one thing you'll find uh, during this time, uh, the more you sleep, the easier it is to deal with hunger. And also, too, that sleep and food have this, you know, revolving relationship. Uh, as you lean out, most people tend to sleep better. As you sleep better, you're not so triggered by hunger. Uh, if you're not so triggered by hunger, you eat less and you lose weight, which seems to help your sleep. And this thing just keeps spinning wonderfully in your direction. Uh, after that, uh, you know, here's, here's an idea for it. It's just, just a thought. Uh, kettlebells, the sandbags and the push-up stands. Uh, I mean, I would, let me just give you a workout I want you to do at least twice a week. Uh, put the kettlebells in the, put the kettlebells over here, maybe 20 meters, 30 meters, and then put the push-up stands over here. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do either swings or goblet squats at the start with those kettlebells. If it's swings, 10, 15. If it's goblet squats, five to 10. Then pick up the duffel bag and walk it over the push to the push up thing. Pop on the ground, give me three, five, 10 push ups, whatever is easy at first. Jump up, grab the duffel bag, go back. Swing or goblet squat, duffel bag, push up. Duffel bag, swings, goblet squat. Uh, and I, well, here's a great idea already is that one day do the swings, one day do the goblet squats. And just go back and forth. Uh, I would start off with maybe um, uh, the, the round, so down and back. So with this is a round, the swings, the duffel bag, the push up, the duffel bag, that's a round. Swings, duffel bag, push ups duffel bag. That's two rounds. I would say in the beginning, try five rounds. First time, five. See how you feel. Uh, I'd love to see you build up to 20 rounds of that. Now that's, um, I would suggest only doing that one time and making that like your challenge. So the challenge of this whole program is that you can do this one time, 20 times. So there's two, two workouts in a week for you. The other, the other workout, if you're just doing one, well, I'd love to see you do the armor building complex, and that's the the root of how I now train uh, bodybuilding hypertrophy for um, with kettlebells. That's that's become like my go to, my standard. Okay, um, it, yes, it's a complex, but 
people seem to have this ability to just keep going and going on it. And that's, that's money when it comes to hypertrophy work. If you can't do the armor building complex, uh, please, uh, if you can't, that's fine. Then maybe do something like just a lot of presses on that third day, uh, uh, vertical overhead presses. So presses, alternate press, one arm press, two hand press, whatever you decide. If you do decide to do a fourth day a week, um, I would love to see you take this, I mean, this idea on the road. A fun thing might be, um, <laughs> of course, I love this kind of thing. So, so it's, it's a thing I, I do with certain military groups. Uh, you get a backpack, you drop your kettlebell in there. With you, you could also drop those push-up stands and you go for a hike and, I don't know, set a timer every five minutes. You stop, you take the backpack off, you do 15 swings, 10 push-ups, put it back on, keep hiking, try to hike for six rounds of that. I mean, try to find a loop or something like that. And I think you would... Uh... And so remember, remember, gentle listener, that when it comes to exercise for fat loss, uh, you really have to find exercises that you're not very good at it. I, the way word, the two words I put back to back are inefficient exercise. So, you know, if you're a former collegiate swimmer um, and you were at the nationals and all that, and you quit and put on 50 pounds of body fat, jumping back in the pool isn't going to help you because now you're more buoyant and with your background, you're too good at swimming. Uh, the example I always use is I have that, I have a cruiser I ride, and I ride it far. But my cruiser, if I'm going up a hill, I have to go, because eh, it only has one speed and it's got coaster brakes. For me to go up a hill, it's, huh, huh, huh. and I'm talking about a very small hill. In my neighborhood, we have a hill that's probably like this, and I have to get up in a crank. If the hill goes like this, and I live in Utah, it's straight up. I have to get out the bike and push it because my bike weighs about 90 pounds. If I have a billion dollar racing bike and a streamlined help, a helmet and all the other gear, I can go a hundred miles and not even break a sweat. I, I imagine I'm just making that up. So make sure your exercises for body fat loss remain inefficient. The kettlebell swing is a great exercise. I said years ago, it's a fat building, a fat burning exercise. Uh, one word. I said years ago that the kettlebell swing is a fat burning athlete builder. And uh, I still stand by that. The swing is an amazing exercise. The reason I like the push up for fat loss is that you have to get down on the ground. You have to get back on the ground, get back up, on the ground, get back up, which is a great value. Um, for, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of burpees, but I like, you know, I like mixing standing to push ups. I, I like it. Um, I just hate it when I see people just take that beautiful movement uh, and then turn it into those horrid atrocities I see online all the time. Um, so those would be my ideas. So prove to me you can cut out the 500 calories by doing it two weeks in a row. Then figure out a really appropriate way to cut out those 500 calories. Um, it's real easy to, if you just get rid of it, if you're an American, just stop eating crappy carbs. I mean, it's that easy. Uh, I read a thing, and I, I hope it's wrong, but they said that the average American consumes on Super Bowl Sunday 8,000 calories. I mean, if you're eating 8,000 calories a day, you know, I don't know how you're going to, I don't know how you outwork that. I don't know how you do it. Um, and then after that, make sure you lock in, maybe try, try that idea, that medley, the gobbled squat and, um, push up with a duffel bag. Try that the first week twice and then gently add the other stuff on. This is a good question. I hear it a lot. Um, of course, if you do easy strength for fat loss, it's available danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. Uh, I got a lot more ideas for you and I think you're in the right wheelhouse for what I would suggest. All right. Thank you. We have a question from Tim. And Tim says this, I am curious to hear your thoughts about the benefit and downsides of using long rest periods, 10, 15, or even 20 minutes for powerlifting and strongman training, specifically for heavy compound lifts, such as squats, bench presses, or deadlifts. For example, 
doing five sets of five squat program with near maximal loads, something which already requires long rest periods. I asked this because I heard a story about a fellow grad student powerlifter who claimed his training secret was to bring his laptop to the gym and work for tw about 20 minutes between heavy squat sets. Well, so, okay, let's, let's separate what you mean by powerlifter. Now, if you're a competitive powerlifter and you're in a competition where you have a 20 minute rest between your lifts, I like this idea. Uh, one of the things I started to pick up at some of the meets, like at the nationals in Olympic lifting, you know, in regional meets, once my name is called for my first lift, usually all three of my snatches, all three of my clean and jerks are finished probably in six or seven minutes on the clock. Because I t you, very often in small local meets, you follow yourself. So um, doing something like this, Tim, if if you're a power lifter in regional meets, uh, you, you, you might not have trained your ability to recover. That weird specific recovery, like I'm out of breath sometimes when I, uh, especially clean and jerks, I'm still out of breath. <sighs> from the opener or the second attempt, but I'm actually recovered enough to lift. It's, I mean, it's the nerves, it's the cold building, it's the, you know, trying to cut weight. It's all, all the factors keep my respiration a little bit higher. It's, it's stress. Are there values in the longer rest periods? I can remember reading articles, this is a long time ago. I might have the information in my little red book uh, this I keep this little red book that I, through the years that I find something really interesting. Um, of course, it's not going to be right there. Of course, I won't be able to find it right now. But uh, I would write down little ideas or gems that I thought had value. And I remember reading that some of the bigger, uh, the super heavyweights for like Russia and some other places were taking five to seven minute rest periods. Now, part of the reason you're doing that is you're looking at a person who's body mass, you know, exceeds 140, maybe 150 kilos, uh, 308 to 330 or so. So <laughs> that five to seven minute rest period is because that heart and lungs uh, are, are going through so much effort. I think in my experience, 20 minutes is excessive. I can't, I couldn't imagine spending that much time in the gym, not training. Um, I mean, I, my life has been in the gym, in the weight room, but I like to be in there and work out. And even when I finish working out, if someone says, hey, can you help me? I'm always like, I wanted to go. Um, I mean, it always help, but yeah. So I would say it's excessive, but it's an interesting idea. For a sport power lifter, I don't think it makes sense because of the, the rest periods would not mimic what you do when it meets. Though I have been to some powerlifting meets and there are some long waits. I guess you're gonna to have to go to a few meets and read it. If you're just a gym power lifter and you're doing this experiment that your friend is talking about, uh, I would, uh, I, I, I mean, I have no experience with it. Uh, I've had rain delays, I've had lightning delays. And I always know how hard it is to gear back up after a 20 minute delay of any kind. But uh, it's an interesting idea. And I guess, Tim, the thing is, if you try this and you make some of the best gains of your life, get back to me and then I'll pretend I invented it, okay? It's a good question. Um, on the sports side, probably not. On the interesting, let's, let's run this up the flagpole and see how it looks kind of thing. It's an interesting idea. So thank you, Tim, appreciate that. Oh, okay, Mo asked a real simple question. What would be a good goal for my body weight for the suitcase carry? 100% of body weight, 50, 33. Do you have any recommendations on how to build up my suitcase carry weight? So the suitcase carry, you know, with farmer bars, uh, okay, so when I test the farmer bar test, we, we use the hex bar or trap bar, okay? It's real easy to load. Um, if I put it on four big plates, you know, 420 kilos, 445 pounds, it's 225 and there's no more math. I also have my competition ones that weigh 45 pounds, but to get to 225, or it doesn't matter what it is, there's a whole bunch, so we have two separate things. So 
with my um, with my suitcase carry, this is gonna be my best work, but you'll get the point. Here's my handles. So with the hex bar, it's all one piece. So the load is the load is the load. With the competition farmer bars, I've got two separate things. I've got a load here and I got a load here and I got a load here and I got a load here. And it's a lot of math to make everything work out my, uh, evenly. So uh, I like body weight with the trap bar as a test. And the body weight is usually, I just give you the numbers. It's 135 if you're 135 and below. 136 to 185, it's 185. 186 to 225, it's 225. And 226 and above, it's 225. It just saves you a lot of hassle. When we're doing farmer bars, uh, we just load them as, we just load them heavy if I'm using the competition ones. And that just, that changes everything. When it comes to the suitcase carrying, you've probably already picked up on that. Once you get to a certain number, and you know, it's basically about 40 kilos, about 85 pounds, 88 pounds. But if you're doing suitcase carries with the 85s, 40 kilos, you, you begin to pick up the issue with the suitcase carry. Once you get around that 40 kilo mark, 85 pounds, as you move, the load the load begins to pull you over to the side. Now, that's why you do suitcase carries, because as that load is pulling, you fight the barbell back, uh, you fight the, the weight back up. Good. But after 40 kilos, a lot of people just can't do it. It's too much load while you're walking, okay? So I tend to have a mental, okay, once you get to 40 kilos, 85 pounds, you're in the wheelhouse of good. Now, Lots of people I work with can slide up to those 125 pound dumbbells that you see at a lot of gyms. At my old gym, I had 150 pound dumbbells. And I gotta t tell you, <laughs> doing suitcase carries with 150 pounds, uh, it, it, it's fascinating because you, you get that drunk on a boat walk. I mean, you really start to stumble because the, you're, you're, this system is fighting so hard to stay erect, but there's enough load to just ruin. And every time you take a step, of course, you know, one foot leaves the ground, uh, the stability issues really explode. Um, so I don't know what 125 pounds is with your body weight, but let's, but let's just say that's half body weight for some people listening, a third. I like a third, build it up to a half, Doing a body weight suitcase carry, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could do it. I mean, I don't know if that's, if I, no, no if I could do it. M more like, I don't know how much value it would have because you would be just getting so pulled over. You might be able to get away with it with just like a, uh, so like a, a suitcase deadlift and then just stand and get a sense of how much torque is on this side. Breathe out. <sighs> And then maybe take one step and see what happens. Uh, I have a I have a standard. It says carry body weight for X steps. And people always ask me, what's the, how many steps is X? And the answer is any. So if, if you can do a body weight suitcase carry, any steps you take are awesome. So I I hope that answered the question. Generally, the forty kilo bar, uh, the forty kilo eighty five pound mark is true for most people. Obviously, a lot of people can get up to 120, 55-ish uh, kilos, 25, 55-ish kilos-ish. Uh, but after that, you, you start to really not get the benefits of the carry itself, I think. I would like to see the video of you doing the body weight uh, suitcase carry, okay? Thank you, great question. John asked a question, and this is, uh, John is uh, someone who's been around a while. I'm a 74 year old male, and I've been following you on the internet ever since you published your first issue of Get Up. That's been a while ago, so thank you. And offered comments on the internet forum, Old School Strength Training. I have lifted weights most of my life, and like many our age, I am self-taught from articles in Strength and Health, Muscular Development, and Iron Man magazines. So good, the two uh, York magazines and Iron Man, all classically great. I have been trying sumo deadlift squats using the Hungarian Core Blaster, great piece of equipment. Using the Core Blaster, I can position myself well to eliminate most strain in my lower back. 
Do you believe this is an effective substitute for Goblet Squads? And if so, would you suggest the programming is similar to Goblet Squads in terms of weight, sets, and reps used? Or must I go heavier because of the mechanical advantage? Um, one of the things I, I hope you're doing, John, is when you do use the Hungarian Core Blaster, for those of you who don't know, it's the T-handle, then there's a bar here and there's a little plate, uh, a little plate that holds the, the, the weightlifting plates on top. Um, I have found that American iron 25 pound plates are the best thing to stack them up. They stay, they stay narrow. If you use 45s, they are gonna hit your shins and your, the insides of your ankles and it hurts, so don't do that. But if you're gonna do squats with this, if you're gonna do the way I'm thinking of doing them, where you have the weight in that, uh, in that position here, so I'm at the top of a deadlift, if you're gonna squat, be sure your feet are on blocks of some kind, because otherwise, as you descend with the weight, and what's nice about the Hungarian Core Blaster in squatting is as you descend, you can let your forearms and elbows slide between your inner thighs and knees so that you can track a good squat position. But you do want to have a little bit of elevation. In my gym, the one I use is probably about that high, okay? And... Um, it works out really well. Um, when I'm down at the bottom, it is a nice squat position. Um, now, the nice thing about doing the Hungarian Core Blaster squat, the T-bar squat, is that when I hit the bottom position, um, I have a chance, because of the load, to really, okay, my shoulders are rolling forward, rolling back. It's, it's just a nice way to prepare. I would say, yeah, what you said about the goblet squat idea is exactly right. I mean... You know, try them, try, um, put 25 pounds, put 50 on, put 75. Get a sense for how many reps you're comfortable with each one of those loads. And then, by the way, that's not a terrible workout. Do a set with the one plate, two plates, three plates. That's, not, that's, a, that's a good little workout. Um, get a sense for your reps on that. If Once you get to 75 or 100 pounds, you really start to feel your you know, things barking on your body, your knees, your back, whatever it could be or you feel like it's just, yeah, I don't want to do this, stop and stay with those lighter weights. So I would recommend a little bit lighter on uh, this kind of squat. Um, there's traditionally there's a lot of names for it. And since you read Iron Man magazine, you'd probably remember uh, that this was a common exercise back in the day too. A um, whole bunch of different, uh, there is a, a piece of equipment that, that you can hook around your waist, a belt, and you hook a rope or a chain to weights and that exercise is called the belt squat and that was popular a long time ago and I, uh, and I still think there's great great value for it so uh, I like it good question uh, when it comes to squats you know you're generally thinking I think for most people 15 to 30 15 to 25 total reps three sets of eight five sets of five is all most people ever need I mean obviously if you're, on, if you're on a short term mass building program those numbers go way up but year in year out month in month out get those 25 ish reps in and just keep coming back okay thank you john good question okay simon asks a question and simon says my question is centered around developing a daily kettlebell exercise program based on the push pull hinge squat loaded carry protocol you recommend it's funny to say that because simon Dan John University has this thing called the workout generator, and you are now inside my brain the moment you turn on the workout generator. Um, you would put in what equipment you have, and in your case, you would write in a kettlebell, and it will spit out a workout tailored for you. If you don't like an exercise, you can just put your finger on it and scroll up or down, or your cursor, and change an exercise you want to do more. But let's continue with your question. I find that when I reduce the volume, but increase the frequency of my practice, I experienced less soreness, which helped me participate more effectively in jujitsu class. That, see, I think that that's a good point. My concern is centered around hypertrophy. With the reality of, of, of various bone diseases in older populations and uh, weakening of muscle mass, is there a program that can maintain increased muscle mass but keep soreness at bay on a daily practice protocol? So Simon, yeah, I mean that's why I like. Okay, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm selling my stuff, but I believe in it. 
you can lift five days a week with the workout generator. And if you pick good choices, um, you know, you could have, you could have two, three, four, five different choices a week for your push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry variations. If you do that and you keep the reps reasonable and the, the generator will help you with that. Say you're doing two sets of five, um, two sets of five on Monday military press, two sets of five Tuesday with the incline press and the, and the loads are reasonable. You'll keep away from soreness and you'll get very strong. Um, when you said my concern is cent centered around hypertrophy, um, you want to maintain increased muscle mass, uh, but you want to keep soreness at bay. Um, I think that's why easy strength works so well. And I think that's why if you push, pull, hinge, squat, load, or carry in an, in a more, the style you're talking about, I think you can chase both, both qualities you're looking for. Soreness does happen. Um, I mean, I'd been doing barbell front squats for a long time and then started doing the armor building complex with the two double cleans, one double press and three double kettlebell front squats. Well, my legs acted like they had never done a squat in my entire life. I, I was so sore. Uh, there's that weird little squat muscle that seems to always. So soreness can come just by changing exercises. Now, what's interesting is I'm telling you, I want you to change exercises, but with the volume you're talking about doing, uh, easy strength numbers, or um, you, you want to reduce the volume and increase the frequency. To me, that just drives us right into easy strength. Um, you, you, you might be able to just do that. Um, there's going to be a little bit of experimenting for you to do. Uh, there might be a few exercises that look good when you see them, but cause excessive soreness and it impact your mat work. Those are the ones you have to say, good idea, but not now. Okay. Good question, Simon. And speaking of good questions, um, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, this week's questions were, were kind of fun to read. They were easy, easy answers for me. I thought there was a lot of insight and depth. It was, it was fun. I, I feel this is the last few months. I've really felt like I'm enjoying doing this. I, I, I feel like the, the, the reader's questions really, uh, hit on some parts of my brain that made me go, Oh, that's a good point. And I got to tell you, I mean, I've been lifting since 1965. Anytime you guys can inspire me, y'all can inspire me to, to get some new insights. Thank you so much. So remember, if you have questions, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. This is a Q&A podcast, so your questions are really valuable to me. And as I always say, until next time, let's keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.